Welcome to the Bullington Capital Report, hosted by Bill Bullington. For the next hour, you'll receive information on current market conditions and trends that could affect your financial future. If you have a question, you can participate in today's program by calling 216-901-0945. That's 216-901-0WHK. You can also reach Bill by going to his website, BullingtonCapital.com. And now, here's Bill Bullington. Well, welcome back. Feel free to give us a call, 216-901-0945. If you'd like to participate in today's program or if you have a question you'd like to have answered, yeah, this program is a Bullington Capital Report. By the way, we'll be launching again pretty soon, within the next two weeks, the Lookout for the Bull. And that was an old website I had up a couple different times. We're going to do it again. Uh, I've got a co-author and a co-sponsor. Uh, his name is Michael Seeger. You might have heard him on a radio show here a couple of weeks ago. He's a student at Case, and so we're going to have uh, him helping me out here. Actually, we're going to be doing this together. So I'm going to provide a lot of the research, and he's going to uh, help me write and produce the uh, the website. So that should be a lot of fun. <clears throat> so stay tuned for that. I want to uh, remind everybody that we have a workshop coming up, and that's pretty quick. We call them seminars, workshops, whatever you'd like to call it. That's okay. Just show up. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You can go to uh, BullingtonCapital.com to sign up online. <clears throat> the uh, title of the workshop is The Highest Return That You Can Get on Safe Investments, quote-unquote safe investments. And we'll be talking a lot about fixed income, government bonds. We'll be talking about uh, a lot of things that people consider to be safe but may have a lot of risk. And we're going to be talking about some of the things that don't have as much risk as people think they do. In fact, right now, I'd make a, uh, no, I'm not going to say I'm going to make an argument because I'm not going to argue. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make a statement. If you look at the stock market and you look at the earnings yield, okay, the earnings yield, it's actually the opposite of a P.E. ratio. I'm not a real fond of the P.E. ratio, by the way. I think they should have spoken in, in terms of the earnings yield a long time ago. And I, in fact, I've been speaking about that my entire career. Now I'm going to emphasize it because it helps you understand. The earnings yield is what you would get if you got to keep all the profits that a company generated based on its current share price. I'll give you a quick example. Say a stock ABC company is selling for $20 a share and it has a dollar dividend. Or not not dollar dividend. Let's say it has a dollar in earnings per share or had a dollar over the past 12 months. If you were the owner of ABC Company and you bought every share outstanding at $20, that dollar per share, that's yours. That's what you get for being in business, for risking your capital. Okay, That's your profit. Same thing as uh, interest on a CD. And, it, and uh, Except that interest on a CD is still taxable and the earnings is after tax. <laughs> okay, but be that as it may, twenty dollars stock earns a dollar share. A dollar is five percent of twenty bucks. Is that good or bad? Well, it's actually the long term average on a ten year treasury, which we consider kind of a uh, a benchmark or a target, so to speak. And you look at that, go, all right, that's good. You know, if I got five percent. I'm uh, I'm happy with that. If the uh, and that's all it is. So you're basically you're converting. The profits per share into a yield. So now you can compare it to a CD. And like I said, the long-term average on a 10-year treasury is about 5%. Long-term average on a 30-year treasury is about 6%. So uh, you could use either one of those numbers, but it gives you a good idea of how to ballpark what a stock should be selling for. Now, it's really easy. All you have to do is find out what the earnings per share have been and Divide that by 5%. I'll, I'll give you a little hint here. There's another thing you can do that's a little simpler than that. Just multiply those earnings by 2 and add a 0 to it. In other words, multiply it by 20. Get the same number. So if you if you have trouble dividing by 0 0.05 in your head, just multiply it by 2. So double the, the earnings number and add a 0 to it. So again, dollar a share, what's 2 times a dollar? It's 2. If I add a 0 to it, it's 20. 
Woohoo! I'm done. Because now, if you do that, if you did that to all 500 stocks, the S and P 500 right now, and then you separated them out into the groups that they're in, so the utilities are going with the utility stocks, the consumer defensive is going into the consumer defensive, yeah, health care companies are going into health care. If you were to do that, split them up into their various categories, various sectors, you would find that there are only three out of 11 sectors that are that don't have earnings yields of at least 5%. Only three. So when you hear the market's overvalued, it's going to crash, don't pay attention. It doesn't matter. <laughs> If it crashes, then you should be a buyer. Why? Because those stocks are undervalued right now. They're undervalued. The only sectors that are uh, slightly overvalued are the ones that have actually been doing the best, and their growth rates are the highest. So you know what? They probably deserve to sell at a slight premium. So what am what am I saying here? I, I'm getting inundated. I'm getting bombarded from people who say the market's going to crash. Well, sure it is. At some point in time, it always does. <laughs> that, that's like saying, oh, my gosh, winter's coming. It's going to snow. Yeah, it will. But I'm not, go, I'm not so sure I'd put my snow coat on now. <laughs> yeah. In fact, you want to keep that coat in the closet, just keep it ready. Understand it's going to snow again. Don't think you're going into another ice age because it snows the same thing with the stock market. It's just part of the way the market behaves. And incidentally, this is why our snow coat that we're keeping in the closet is the cash we keep in our accounts. Always be ready to buy. Now, at some point in time, this may change. At some point in time, you may tune into this radio program or the podcast, also being hosted on 955thefish.com. I don't know if you guys have ever listened to that station. I just took a trip. And uh, this is how my mind works, by the way. I go from one subject to another. <laughs> so I, I took a trip to see a couple clients, went down through Cincinnati, went down through Kentucky, turned around, came back. And there are a ton of stations, contemporary Christian stations, kind of like 95.5 The Fish, where uh, this show is also hosted as a podcast. So if you miss it here, you miss it on my website. You can always, always go to The Fish, and it's being hosted there. And uh, there are a bunch of stations out there that are trying to mimic the the format of the fish. And I got to tell you, they're they're pretty good. Not as good. <laughs> they're not as good. I think they've probably just been doing it longer here. But the uh, um, but it's a really good format anyway. So uh, if you miss it here, it you, you don't have a well. If you have internet access, you can get it at the fish's website or my website. I, I frequent the fish website. They've got a lot of. Uh, uh, good stuff going on there, too. Anyway, I, I divert, uh, which I'm constantly doing. But there are a lot of stations out there now that just have really good contemporary music. So we were talking about a whole bunch of things. And by the way, feel free to email me if you have questions that you'd like me to talk about on the radio, uh, financial questions. Yeah, I think it's kind of funny. I'm, I'm re-reviewing. I'm going to reinstate and re retake all the exams uh, for the uh, CFP, which I think is it's kind of funny. Uh, they make so much, a, a big deal out of an awful lot of things that are incredibly small. <laughs> Do you really need to know that? Yeah, probably not. The, uh, but in case you're that one in a thousand person that comes up with that particular event, then yeah, yeah, you should probably know that. I just think it's kind of funny. And, uh, and it is fun. <laughs> kind of nice to uh, review all this stuff, go through it. The, um, some of it's a uh, little bit different, especially the part about the uh, uh, retirement plans. That's really changed a lot over the years. That's really changed. Um, so it's kind of exciting. You've got a, an awful lot. There are more options now than there used to be. And uh, while I'm mentioning that, you know, I built a model specifically for the Cleveland Clinic's retirement plans. They've got uh, three of them there that we're able to work with. We can actually manage that money for you. And you should call us up if you uh, work for the clinic and want to see it. I'll send it to you. It's, it's an email. The, uh, I'll send you a, uh, an explanation of what we do and uh, how you might have done using that. And it's improved uh, over the past couple of years. In fact, 
No, what's really interesting is there used to be a couple funds that that they removed uh, in uh, you know back. I know why they removed them because they they got too big and the the funds they replaced them with are awfully good, and they're smaller the way that those were uh, before they removed them. Uh, see what what happens with the fund is if you're really successful as a mutual fund, the money comes pouring in, and eventually you're forced out of the category. It's like a boxer who's a uh, flyweight who beats everybody in his weight class. You know, in boxing, you keep moving up into in your weight class until you lose. <laughs> That's what you do in mutual funds. You keep gathering more and more assets until you just can't manage it anymore, and then your your returns aren't as good as they used to be, and you're not sticking to the category that you're representing when you first started. The most typical example of something like that would be small company stock funds who grow, have great track records, and suddenly you've got billions of dollars in assets in, in the fund. It's not suddenly. It is pretty suddenly sometimes. But as the assets grow, you're forced out of that category because there are only a certain number of stocks in that category to begin with. And when you own practically all of them, you have to start buying companies that are slightly bigger. And then before you know it, you're a blend fund. You're buying small, medium, and large companies. And performance normally drops a little bit. More often than not, it's going to drop a little bit. So some of those funds are actually gone now. And uh, it's too bad. I wish I could show you the results of having done this in those days when those funds were available. Uh, not that the new funds are, are, they're not worse, by the way. They're actually good. They're probably better than the ones they replaced. But there is a, there's a there been a replacement there, and we have a very specific model. We can actually manage this for people. Uh, we can manage your retirement plans through the clinic for you. So just give us a call, and we'll tell you more about that. Another thing I wanted to mention, there is a, uh, there's a bunch of annuities uh, that are out there. If you have an annuity and you would like us to review it, uh, we're, we'd be glad to do that. We use an annuity that has no sales charge in or out. There's no penalty for early withdrawal. That's one thing you should ask when you're thinking about buying these. Are there penalties? And if they are, if there are, how long are they? Uh, how much is it going to cost you? And today, you know, this is our, actually a relatively recent development. The fact that annuities that have no sales charges in or out, they have um, gained in popularity. They weren't very popular before because they didn't pay very much. And today, the expense ratios on annuities can be extremely low or extremely high. If you have one and you'd like us to take a look at it, we'd be glad to do that. Because there is a product from Nationwide. Nationwide bought this company out. There was a company called Jefferson National that made a product that had an extremely low uh, cost for the insurance charges on an annuity. See, some, a lot of annuities have insurance charges. People aren't even aware of that. You know, they're not. Most people aren't aware of how much they're paying in the annuity. So again, you can be paying as much as you know, four or five percent a year in some cases, and in a lot of cases, in many, many, many cases, you don't really have any idea how much you're paying. Like if, if somebody's making a guarantee of your principal and saying you can get eighty percent of the stock market returns, something along those lines. That is an incredibly expensive product. They're saying you could possibly get up to that much. I'm telling you, the way that it's structured, it's highly unlikely that that's going to happen, and it's highly unlikely that you have a track record that's as good as a short-term senior banknote fund, which is paying around three, a little over 3% right now. It's highly unlikely that you'll do as well as that bank fund out there that's paying a little over 3%. So you know, give us a call. Let us take a look at that for you if you'd like us to. Don't worry. You know, we I always like to tell everybody we're not a low-pressure firm. We're a no-pressure. I have a hard time calling back to people who want to talk to me. <laughs> so we don't have time to put pressure on anybody. We have to, we've got to move too fast. And uh, since I brought that up, I've got two people that work with me and uh, an intern and someone that works on the outside of the office and I got to tell you, for a, a small group, we move really fast and we do a, a really good job. Of course, you know, obviously that would be my opinion. It's my company. <laughs> but you can try us out and see what you think. 
So you can go to BullingtonCapital.com to find, you know, ask questions. Uh, if you want us to review your, your portfolio, you're working at the clinic, you want us to take a look at that. Actually, the PERS, I'm building a model for that now, too. Uh, if you're a uh, STRS, we're building models for that. So if you're in any of those retirement plans, we'll be glad to uh, help you out here. Uh, retirement planning is a big deal. You, you know, and they need to start teaching this actually to kids that are like 12 years old. And by the way, you guys that are teaching that market cap weighted just by the S&P 500, you guys need to come to my seminar and you need to take some of my material. In fact, I'm going to give you material. Uh, there's, there are a whole bunch of uh, educational groups. They're going around and talking to 12 year olds, but they're not telling, a, uh, in, in my opinion, the complete story because they're recommending just the S&P 500. At least a couple of the people that I talked to had recommended that. And I'm going, no, that, that is way too risky. That's way too risky. You need to spread that out. You need to spread that risk out. we got a couple minutes here before the commercial break, so I don't want to really get into what I'm going to talk about when I'm talking about spreading it out yet. I'll wait until after the commercial break and talk about that. But we're talking about investing in large stocks, medium-sized stocks, small stocks, international and emerging market. And I think you should have all those categories represented. You should have all those categories represented. And I'm even going to take issue, particularly now, with the standard asset allocation, which overweight, the standard al asset allocation, by the way, which is generally accepted by the government and a whole bunch of state pensions around the country, is a version of a market cap weighted index using all those categories. I am not in agreement with that, because especially right now. What's happening in the United States is that a small select group of stocks are giving people the impression that all stocks are going up because of how the S&P 500 is constructed. That's not true. That is absolutely not true. And they're teaching that uh, to other people, so this myth is, is going to keep going on. I'm going to try to be the counter teacher. Let me show you why you don't want to do that. Let me show you why you probably want to spread it out more than that. You think you're diversified because it's, yes, it's 500 stocks. Yeah, but 50% of the, of the value is in the top 50 stocks. That means, I just lost my hearing there for a second. Hey, I got to take a real quick commercial break. You're listening to Bill Bullington right here on 1420 The Answer. I'll be right back after these messages. Raise my hands up to the Father. Gave it all to Him that day. Fell to new. And we're back. So if you'd like to call us, 216-901-0945, 216-901-0945. And we're talking about a bunch of different topics, which uh, we kind of do almost every week here on the Billington Capital Report. Uh, feel free to call us or send us questions if you'd like. The um, phone number here, I, I'm, I'm sorry, my website uh, is Bill. My email address is Bill at BillingtonCapital.com. You can also go to the website and re fill out a contact us form there, and uh, that's fine too. So, uh, and again, that number 216-901-0945. And, oh, you know, don't get old. <laughs> I know you can't resist it, but when you get old, you start forgetting things. Like, I forgot what we were uh, talking about. So I'm going to go back to the uh, highest rate of return you can get on quote unquote safe investments. That's a workshop we got coming up at September 20th. That's a Thursday. It's going to be Tri-C's Corporate College. Feel free to come stop by. We uh, always talk about a, a lot of topics. We're going to talk for about 45 minutes, take a 15 minute break, come back, answer questions. Let's talk about 45 minutes, come back and answer questions. And I think the, well, the reason I put the word safe in quotation marks is because everybody's definition 
of the word safe is slightly different. Most people are thinking about CDs. I'll tell you, most people think about CDs when they think about safe investment. Some people think about government bonds. Some people think that certain stocks are safe. You know, they're safe because they're so comfortable with them. That, that can be very dangerous, by the way. Yeah, that can be very dangerous. So we're going to look at safe, a lot of its definitions. I'm going to look at the highest rates that you can find uh, on CDs. There's a little trick if you have uh, a little bit of time on your hands that you can use to find CDs that are slightly higher than the highest rates advertised on the Internet. How do I know that? Because I've been doing this for a very long time, <laughs> and I'll show you. I wouldn't get too excited about it, though. You're, you're talking about a quarter of a percent higher than what you might see uh, on Bankrate or advertising the Wall Street Journal. A quarter of a percent is a lot if you're talking about a million dollars. But if you're talking about 10000 or even 100000 know, I guess a quarter percent is a lot at 100000 It's $250 a year. So I'll show you how to, to be able to do that, at least be able to compare and shop. So there's a, uh, there's some funds out there that people are investing a lot of money in that have been receiving a lot of uh, um, incoming cash flow. And those funds are actually a little higher risk. The risk is in what they're doing. And the names of the funds are the reasons that people are, are investing in them. They don't really understand all the ramifications that are involved in investing that way. So we talk, we'll be looking at that too. We'll be looking at stocks. A lot of people think that there are safe stocks out there, and I, I'm not sure I would disagree with that. I think there are ways that you can make it a lot safer to invest in stocks, and we're going to talk about that specifically. There are lots of ways you can make it a lot safer. And there are some firms now that are doing some things I think are interesting. I'm not sure how much I will be utilizing these services, but you can take a fund and they will actually hedge it for you. They'll put a hedge on that fund so that you can't be down below a certain percentage. And I think that's, that's really fascinating. I know what they're doing. I'm just surprised that they're doing it on such a large scale. You could do that yourself if you knew a whole lot about you know, options and uh, futures contracts, but being that most people don't, I would I would say stay away from it from an individual standpoint. That's not safe. If you don't know what you're doing in that area, mm, boy, that could be really bad. So anyway, we'll, we'll be focusing on the uh, more traditional safe stuff. We'll take a look at what a lot of the annuities are doing out there that are uh, calling themselves safe. Some of them are uh, safe, but you may not make any money. <laughs> so that's it. That's not a good thing. Uh, right now, I think one of the safer stock strategies you could use is look at value-oriented stuff. It hasn't kept up with the other um, categories, the small cap value, large cap value, mid cap value. They haven't done as well as the growth has in each one of those categories for the past five years or so. And this is where there's opportunity. In this marketplace, this is where the opportunity is. Those categories that have been underperforming now are undervalued. Many of them are, at least on a historical basis. So if they're undervalued, what should you logically be looking for? Do you want the overvalued ones because they've gone up a lot? Or do you want the undervalued ones that may have the uh, ability to go up higher without becoming overvalued? Yeah, that. Not a, not a trick question. If, if I'm looking at where I want to be positioned going forward, I want the stocks that are undervalued, not those stocks that may be overpriced. And incidentally, the easiest funds to sell right now, if you're buying funds from a commissioned broker, are the funds that have the best five-year track records because they're basically in a lot of high-tech stocks because they didn't get the big track record by investing in companies that are out of favor. <laughs> they were buying stuff that, that just kept going up. And you know what? As long as you keep buying something, it'll keep going up. Self-fulfilling prophecy. And it's been going on. And, and by the way, it, it goes on all the time. I and mean, it's just part of the way that the stock market works. So 
why you got to have a lot of patience. You got to have a lot of understanding. You have to understand that. Like I put together a hypothetical illustration. What is a hypothetical illustration? Well, it's one of those illustrations where it says, if you'd have done this, and one of the reasons I did it is because the funds that I'm using have all been around since 2003, which is right before I decided to leave the brokerage community and start my own company. And that was one of the reasons. I was an early adopter. I saw what was coming and I decided that I was going to, uh, I wanted to be a part of that and take advantage of it. So the ETF movement at that time period was really just getting underway in a big way. Prior to that, you had a, well, a couple dozen at the most. Now there are several thousand. So you go from a couple dozen to several thousand. I think I saw that coming. <laughs> I left to start my own firm right around the same time. It's actually a little bit after that. When I saw the writing on the wall, I went, hmm. You know, I think I'd like to be a part of that movement. And uh, so I left and decided that uh, you know, I would focus on, make this one area of focus for my practice. So anyway, why am I saying this? Because the ETFs I'm going to talk about here, if you bought them equally, all you did was put an equal dollar amount in each and every one of these, you kept up, you kept up with the best performing one without having to know which one it was. <laughs> so you kept up with the best performing one without having to know ahead of time which one it was going to be. Now, a lot of people say, well, well, so what? That doesn't sound like all that much. Really? Give it a shot. That's all I have to say. Give that a shot. Give it a try. Try to pick out the best performing category for the next 10 years. It's like saying, how many, how many games are the Browns going to win this year? And if somebody gets that number right, believe me, it's not going to be skill. It's going to be luck. So what I'm saying is, what if you could get the same results of knowing which one was going to perform the best and you didn't know? <laughs> what if you could do that? Yeah, well, there's a way, but there is a cost. There's a cost, and I'm not talking cost that you pay out of your pocket. I'm talking about cost of doing the right thing. It's going to look like you're doing the wrong things for a large percentage of the time. And I'll give an example. One of the funds I'm talking about in that mix, and by the way, if you hear this and you want a, a copy of this, I'll shoot it to you. But you, but you, gotta, you have to ask for it specifically. So... Today's show, which is the 1st, September 1st, you just send me a, uh, an email that says, your September 1st show, you were talking about a hypothetical illustration. Could I please get a copy of that? Now, you have to do it that way. Um, I'll explain why later, but the, uh, basically, you just have to ask for this. So one of the funds that's been around since April of 2003 is the Emerging Market Fund. And the Emerging Market Fund actually has a track record that puts it in the top um, 10% of those, or top 20% of the, all these funds that we're talking about. There are eight of them, by the way. So it's one of the top performers over that time period. But if you look from 2007, that fund is actually below where it was in 2007. Now you got to ask me, how in the world... Could that have one of the better track records going back to 2003? It's 2018 now, 15 years. How in the world could that have one of the better track records if it's selling below where it sold in 2007? That's 11 years. Yeah, that's my point. That thing shot. It took off. It was making an unbelievable amount of money from 2003 to 2007. And if you would have missed that, if you would have missed any portion of that, your returns would suffer greatly. Your returns would suffer greatly. Incidentally, one of the reasons that this works is because we rebalance it, uh, or has worked in the past, I should say, is because we rebalance that portfolio. And this hypothetical illustration, I said once a year, you're going to come in, you're going to put everything back to equal. I'm not market cap weighting this. I'm going to put it back to equal. 
Those funds are market cap weighted anyway, so it's even more important to put it back to equal. That's another discussion. We'll have that later. <laughs> so I'm going to put it back to equal. So in those first few years that it was doing spectacularly, you would literally be taking money out and adding it to those areas that hadn't done spectacularly. Why are you doing that? Because at some point in time, all the returns on these funds come to within 1% or 2% of each other. And logically, if you know in the long run the returns should be fairly similar, but in the short run one of them is way ahead, you want to take some money out of that fund and put it in the other ones. That's a very traditional way of managing the money. Now, I will tell you that there's another way of doing it too. You could actually hold the two best performers in that group and just check it once a quarter or a month. That's another, that's another story. That's another show. In fact, that's not quite as effective as it used to be. It still works. It just doesn't work as well as it did back in those days. And this uh, methodology would not have worked as well as that did back in those days, but now uh, it's actually doing a little bit better. There are lots of reasons for that. I can talk about that at the seminar when we're talking about safe investments because safe is a concept. I think you're safer if you spread it out over various categories. I think it's safer if you take money from something that's just gone up a lot and you move that into those other categories that may have been lagging. Because at some point in time, when the pendulum swings back the other way, you'll, be, you'll have caught it. You know, People ask me that all the time. What's the best way to do it? I think that's, especially today, given the environment that we're in today, I think that's the best way to manage a lot of your money. I think it's well, one of the best ways to manage a lot of your money. Now, I'm going to get questions because people say, well, Bill, then uh, how come you have this portfolio you call the momentum model? Because I like that too. It's also a very good way. It's a very good way. Um, there's not, I, I should say, there's not just a handful of good ways. There are lots of good ways. Now, for every good way, there, you know, there's at least one or two ways that aren't so good. Or things that might end up costing you money or costing you returns. BCAP value, that comes to mind. Right? Anybody says cost, opportunity cost. That's what I had a client getting started in that portfolio and, and it went down eight or nine percent over the first year. The market was up, so the spread was like 17%. Oh, it's not gonna catch up. Well, it's up 41% since then. And you know, and I was questioning it too. I was like, oh but brother. But I just stuck it out. And which is also another thing that you have to learn how to do. Quit paying attention to the news. Just pay attention to what you're doing or make sure whoever is managing your money is paying attention to what they're doing <laughs> and let them do their thing. And don't expect to beat the market every day, every week, every year, every month because that particular strategy lags about 60% of the time. Think about that. If it lags 60% of the time, how does it win? Because in the past, and even more recently after we put real money into it, <laughs> it, it has a tendency to make a lot of money in a relatively short time period. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a home run hitter in baseball. You know, he strikes out 70% of the time, at least 70% of the time. But he ends up hitting a lot of home runs. And if you can bat 300, if you can bat 250 and, and get 50 home runs a year, you can make millions of dollars. <laughs> You could fail 75% of the time as long as when you connect, you connect good. <laughs> you knock in 50 uh, home runs in a year, somebody's going to pay you, especially in the major leagues. So that's what we're talking about with the BCAP value. That's one of the reasons I like it. it. It requires a certain amount of mental discipline. I hear the music starting. That means we're taking a qu quick commercial break here. Listen to Bill Bullington right here on 1420 The Answer. Stay tuned. Turns from darkness to light Anytime temptation comes and someone stands to fight Anytime somebody lives to serve and not be served I know, I know, I know I got waves that are tossing me Crashing all over my beliefs And in all sincerity, Lord, I want to be yours And we're back, hey 
If you'd like to call us, 216-901-0945. Got a workshop coming up you might want to get out to. It's the uh, highest rate of return you can get on, quote, unquote, safe investments. And we're going to be taking, taking a look at all the guaranteed interest rates that are out there. Some of them have risks that are different than others. Um, we're going to be talking about the BCAP value model specifically because that's actually, you know, when I first rolled this out, I was thinking, man, this is, a, this is really nice. This is a, an interesting, it, it's more traditional with a twist. The uh, Bullington Capital twist on the value model is um, starting with the biggest 1,500 companies in the United States. So there's going to be some small, medium, and large cap companies in there. We're going to take a measure of the cash flow, which is called EBIT, and divide that by the enterprise value, which is the cost of buying the whole business, and it converts it into a yield so we can compare this against you know, characteristics we can compare different companies to one another and the highest yield is highest yielding stocks are the one you ones you want by 50 of them and every six months you rerun that screen replacing those that have fallen out of the group and adding to those those that have made it into the group and you just wash rinse and repeat that's the bulletin capital value model that's the model that we're actually going to publish in the lookout for the bull and there's a one of my custodians that i use uh, you can actually have a retail account if you wanted to do it yourself online, uh, where you can actually download these symbols right into your account and make your account look just like that. Now, why would I want to do that? Um, first of all, an awful lot of people may not have the assets, uh, a large enough assets to be able to open an account, or maybe they just don't want to, and they'd like to do it themselves. That's great. That's what that's for. Secondly, if you're looking for stocks to buy, you probably should be looking at that list. <laughs> These stocks are, are relatively undervalued and, uh, you know, throughout there, inevitably at some point in time, well, I shouldn't say that. We're not, in the past, some really big winners have come from that list of stocks. So I think that part of it is going to be really interesting as well. I it's really difficult to do this particular strategy at any of the other broker dealers out there because you need to be able to buy fractional shares. You need to be able to reinvest the dividends in fractional shares. And right now, Folio is the only one I know of that can do that. Fidelity can't do it. And I love Fidelity, by the way. I use them for everything else. The, uh, um, but for this particular um, technique, I'm going to need to open an account at Folio. I've got to uh, take a phone call. Now, if you'd like to call us, 216-901-0945. And I've got Matt. Matt, you're on the Bullington Capital Report. Hey, Bill. I, I wanted to talk to you about, um, I had picked up Ford and General Electric back in like 2008 after the Great Recession when they were all beat down and, mm -hmm. and you know, they were, you know, Ford didn't take any of that bailout money and then GE really came back. And I mean, they're really getting hammered again. I was just kind of wondering what you think the long-term outlook is for those two companies. Well, those are really tough. They're really hard because Ford's in such a competitive industry. And, you know, there's so many car manufacturers around the world and so many different models out there. And the cost to build them is incredible. And every time they go to, you know, trade wars are going to affect the price of steel. So they don't have a lot of control over a lot of the, uh, uh, the products that they're manufacturing and their costs. They don't have a lot of control over the costs that they incur. Same thing with GE. GE is really a hugely diversified firm. They're in, man, they make aircraft engines and MRIs. Tell me what those have in common. Right. You know? right. So that, those are incredibly difficult. Now, both of those stocks have shown up in some of the models that I run that looks at the amount of cash that they generate and looks at the enterprise value, the, you know, like how much uh, the business is selling for. One of them, I actually both of them at some point in time have been in the dividend models. And I'll own those stocks as long as they meet that criteria. But once they stop meeting the criteria, they are gone. And that's a four drop down after this last whole thing about, uh, I think that they were not going to be building Ford vehicles in China and their, their price dropped down to around $9 a share. Well, it, it, that would be based on the perception that that's going to be a bad thing for Ford in, uh, mm. it, it might be, it might not, you know, nobody really knows that. They do like to sell stocks, though, when they've, uh, you know, uh, somebody perceives that something's going wrong. And I'm just telling you, any bad news that comes out on a company, especially a company like Ford, 
uh, if it's if enough big institutional investors buy into it, they're going to sell the stock. And then you've got all these right. mutual funds who basically uh, are mutual funds and exchange traded funds that are run by computers. And they're looking at this thing called enterprise value that that when the stock goes down, so does the enterprise value that goes down too. And they will literally be required to sell that stock. So it has nothing to do with the company. It has everything to do with the price, uh, with the price drop. And uh, that, that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm just not a really big fan of trying to think about these things anymore because there are too many players involved in the market. And if I'm going to buy or sell something, I'd rather go with something that's it's got the math. By the way, Ford was a big contributor to the dividend model for a few years there. You know, back when the uh, that, that stock, you know, 2008 got down to two dollars and 29 cents. <laughs> right, right, and that was right around the time I was started picking it up, and you know, mm-hmm. seeing it as, and then the reason I'm bringing this whole thing up is because your whole comments on the value play and deciding where to start putting new money at, um, and you know, I keep looking overseas. I've I've been gradually putting money in, you know, overseas, not a ton, still kind of, you know, obviously the money in Apple and the U.S. economy and our dollar still pretty strong. So, well, so Matt, here, here's what I would do uh, in your position, okay? First of all, um, hit me up, send me an email. I'm going to send you a copy of this illustration. If you can beat this illustration, I'm going to hire you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, I'm going to send you a copy of that for free. These ETFs, they all trade out there. It's, it's very similar to one of the models that I run. Um, I've got... Lots of different models. It depends on what you're doing and, and uh, how your you know, what your risk tolerance is. But the um, anyway, I'll, I'll send you this. Uh, it's really really difficult to beat. I would use that for like most of your money, and then for the for the ones that you want to pick, the ones you want to pick yourself, you want to be like half Peter Lynch and then uh, half Warren Buffett. Yeah, you know, right. Warren Buffett looks at the numbers really hard, but he also looks at the business. In fact, the business is more important. Peter Lynch looked really hard at the business. You know, he focused, but he wouldn't buy it if the numbers didn't support. No matter how much he liked the business, you got to have the numbers too. And mm-hmm. So, like uh, when I'm excited about something, I'm excited about a company like Procter and Gamble, be- right? Because I look at all the products that they make, and I use a lot of those products. They're in my house right now, and they're very profitable. So. Profit, uh, Procter & Gamble's gross profit margin is 45%. That's huge. So Right. Well, and then I know that the, that the big thing Warren Buffett talks about, too, is the companies with the wide moat with lots of cash. Yep. And, you know, you have an Apple that's now a trillion-dollar company. Right. So. Now, and, and some, one, of his, uh, one of his underlings actually invested in Apple stock. Um, they, that wide moat thing, you know, is something that people have been willing to pay for for a long time. That's a little bit more difficult, by the way, than than say Hershey's or Procter and Gamble. Hershey's is not undervalued. Procter and Gamble is is slightly undervalued. The uh, but th- they're both great companies. Uh, I would just like to see Hershey's a little cheaper before I buy it. But if you were to take that earnings yield thing that I was talking about earlier on today's show, take the the earnings that companies generated over the past twelve months. Divide it by five or just multiply it by 20. And if it's a good company and they have a simple business model, Hershey's makes chocolate. I could keep mm-hmm. those guys in business by myself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I do right. eat a lot of chocolate. The, um, so I really like it. I understand their product really well. I'm not so sure about, you know, Apple's products. I know how to use them. Like like partially, <laughs> I'm sitting here with a mm-hmm. MacBook Pro in in my in the radio station, and I've got my iPhone and my uh, Apple Watch. <laughs> I know how to use about I don't know probably ten percent of it. If if I'm right. that, that might even be generous. <laughs> but, but you I, and I are dinosaurs compared to the young kids that are doing this. Oh man, I watch them all the time. That's why I got this kid from uh, uh, Case. <laughs> Right. He's the uh, intern. This kid's he's really sharp. A lot of sharp kids out there. And uh, but anyway, if you th- this is really simple. You you look at those companies right now that are, have a business model that are relatively easy to understand, and have high profit margins. And then you don't want to pay too much for them. 
Okay, so right. that's just that earnings yield thing. Divide the earnings per share by the uh, share price. I'll say, whatchamacallit, uh, let's see, where is this? I'm looking for this on the, uh, oh, shoot, they didn't put it there. Holy cow. Um, Discover Financial Services, kind of, a, it's a stock that I own, and I really like it. So the past 12 months, their earnings per share were $6.32. Well, 20 times $6.32 is 120 bucks. The stock's at 78. Okay. Oh, wow. So I like that. You know, I'm getting a company. And by the way, you think people ever quit using money? Right. <laughs> That's their product. Right. That's what they sell. They sell money. And what's cool about them is that when the prices of stuff go up, stuff goes up because of inflation and the Fed prints more money, they get higher revenue. <laughs> right. You know, actually, the music's playing. You can call me in the office if you want to continue this conversation, but I really appreciate the call, and I hope you have a good okay, weekend. Okay, great. All right, thanks. And for the rest of you, this is Bill Bullington here every Saturday morning from 11 to noon and 14.20 The Answer. Have a good weekend, good investing, and good luck. You just caught another edition of the Bullington Capital Report, broadcasting every Saturday at 11 a.m. on AM 1420, The Answer. If you have a question and you'd like to speak to Bill personally, you can call him at 330-664-0700. That's 330-664-0700. Or online at BullingtonCapital.com. That's BullingtonCapital.com. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. Therefore, no current or prospective client should assume that the future performance of any specific investment, investment strategy, including the investments and or investment strategies recommended and or purchased by advisor or product made reference to directly or indirectly will be profitable. Different types of investment involve varying degrees of risk, and there can be no assurance that any specific investment will either be suitable or profitable for a client's investment portfolio. No client or prospective client should assume that any information presented serves as the receipt of of or substitute for personalized investment advice from the advisor or any other investment professional. The preceding program has been paid for by Bullington Capital Management, LLC.